Now, I'm grateful that God was truthful with me to reveal to me that I was a sinner and that I fell short of God's glory. The Bible says, thou shall not lie. One of the Ten Commandments, right? Pretty simple, just don't lie. Well, have any of us ever told a lie? How many have, have, have ever lied? Just raise your hand, because we've all lied, right? You're guilty. You're guilty of lying at one point or another, and, and, and that means you're a liar. Now, how many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? Just one, right? Just one. The Bible also says, thou shall not steal. How many of you have stolen? Now, we know you're liars, so don't lie. We've all stolen something, right? Now, we've broken two of God's commandments. And you can just go through all ten, and we've broken all ten of them at one point or another. Now, we try to live by them, but not, not to gain salvation, but to get, keep our relationship pure before the Lord. But the Bible's clear that if we break God's commandments, then we're guilty of judgment. We're guilty of judgment. We stand before God, and he says, are you innocent or are you guilty? And we say, we're guilty because we've lied, we've stolen. We haven't loved you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We didn't keep holy the Sabbath day. We mischurched you know, here and there for other things. So we're guilty. Now you go to a court of law here. I, I'm on jury duty right now. So far, I've just been calling in, thank God. I don't want to sit through that. I love jury duty personally. I love going. I learn a lot because they bring in the professionals that, that know about whatever the case is, whether it's drugs or whether it's car accidents, and they talk about motion and infantry. Infant, it, oh, I can't say the word. Uh, the, the power behind the motion uh, and, and all of that. And I, the DNA, sometimes they bring in DNA special. So I love sitting there and, and, and just learning, and especially when I worked for Edison, they paid me for it, so I didn't mind at all. But now, you know, I can't sit long because of my injury, so I don't want to go to jury duty. And I'm just glad that they've just been postponing it. But every time I've gone to jury duty and I've sat there as a juror, and the judge will say, are you innocent or guilty? And they'll say, I'm innocent. Okay, so now we're having a, uh, a uh, jury come in, and we're going to have a trial, and we're going to find out whether you're innocent or whether you're guilty. And then after all the evidence has been... Um, given we go back into the room and we decide okay here's all the evidence and, and this is what the guy did he tried to mail the cocaine through the mail post office breaking federal laws and he mailed it to a certain address and we went into the other side and we found the cocaine and so you know according to all the evidence and so forth he's guilty and so at the end we all uh, sit there and the judge says oh what is your verdict the guy stands up gives the paper to the judge and the judge reads that on the certain counts you know that the man is guilty sentence will be this so, because he broke the law. Can't get around that. Now he goes to jail. So, if we as a human society have these type of laws, which are biblical laws because our founding fathers established them that way, but if we have those laws and those judgments, how much more would God have them? And how much more would God be right because he can read our hearts? He knows exactly what we think we would be found guilty before God. Now, I thank God that he revealed that to me. I, I thank God that through great glory, the Bible says in Matthew chapter five that if you lust for a woman with your eyes, you've committed adultery already. And I'm like, oh, I, I could have said, oh, that's so judgmental, that, that really hurts. But I said, oh, I'm guilty. That's what I thought, I'm guilty of that because the word was being read. Like, I'm guilty. How many of you hated someone? You've committed murder. Oh, I'm, I'm guilty. I thank God for that truth because that truth hit me and it made me think about my life, it made me think about where I'm going. Being guilty, standing before God, yeah, Reuben, you're going to hell <laughs> and, and you deserve it and, and there's no way around it. And I knew that. And of course, then the truth came that Jesus is the truth and he was the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. And I love that truth and that's the truth we all love, right? Because it's so simple, it's so easy. Oh boy, I just cling to him and now I'm saved and I get to go to heaven because he did the work. He died on the cross. He took my sin upon his shoulders and so I don't have to worry about the guilt. I don't have to worry about the judgment because he took the judgment. And so now I get to go to heaven. Now we love that, but we don't love to be told that you're a sinner. We don't love to be told that homosexuality is wrong. We don't love to be told those, those hard truths. Get rid of that world out of your life. Get rid of lying. Get rid of stealing. Get rid of your pride. 
forgive one another. You know, those type of things are really hard to do. But thank God for them because it gets us right with God. So truth is important. And truth may hurt, but truth will always win out in your life and in my life. So Jeremiah continues with this illustration uh, of the yoke from last week in chapter 27. He is opposed by this false teacher in the temple itself. So, so get the picture. They're in the temple of God. And this is the temple, the one in Israel, that, that's not there yet, but will be one day. In the Israel, they're, they're in the court. And there's Jeremiah, and he's maybe walking around there. And there's this other priest or prophet that's walking around too. And they confront each other right there in front of everyone else. And they begin to have this debate with one another. So let's go ahead and read this false prophecy here in verse 1 and it happened in the same year at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah king of Judah in the fourth year in the fifth month the Hahana, the son of Ezer the prophet who was from Gibeon spoke to me in the house of the Lord in the presence of the priests and all the people saying thus speaks the Lord of hosts the God of Israel saying I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Now you remember last week, God asked Jeremiah to put a yoke upon his shoulders and to walk around with this yoke to signify to the people and to the priests and to the king that you are going under bondage and that yoke will be upon you for 70 years and no one will be able to remove it. Well, this guy Hanana comes up and he says, I've broken the yoke. The Lord has spoken to me. And he has said, I've broken this yoke from Jeremiah. Now, we don't know a whole lot about this guy. He's not mentioned anywhere else in scriptures. Um, just here. Uh, he had a common name that was used in that time frame of Israel, which means the Lord has been gracious. So, so when you were speaking with him, you knew that his name meant the Lord has been gracious. He's a priest. He's a prophet. Um, he's like Jeremiah. He's one of his peers. The Lord has been gracious to him, just as he has been to Jeremiah. He's identified here as the son of an unknown Azor from Gibeon. Now, we don't know anything about him, but we know that Gibeon was located in the territory of Benjamin, and that was Jeremiah's hometown. And so they're from the same place, and they're prophets and they're priests, and so they're peers. Now, could there be some competition there? Could there be some respect? Did he come up and say, hey, Jeremiah, I haven't seen you in a long time. You have been home lately? You know, how's the land? I've been home. I saw my mom and my parents and so forth. Hey, you remember that guy that we used to hang around with over there when we were kids running around? You know, that was that type of relationship. Now, it was one of the priest cities, Joshua twenty one seventeen, which suggests that Hananiah may have himself been a priest there in the temple. And so he was comfortable being in the temple. He was also a very religious man. Now, if this is true, his credibility as a prophet would have been enhanced because of his priestly status. And so he had some status with the people. The people respected him. He, he was a religious leader. He, he was a priest offering up sacrifices and offering for the people. The people would come and, and meet him probably on a regular basis, bringing their sacrifices. Hey, Hannah, nice to see you again. Here's my sacrifice. You know, here's my offerings and so forth. And so they, they knew this person very well. We could say that of, of our society today. We, we know certain people. We may not know them personally, but we know of them. The Joel Osteens, you know, the Paul Crouches on TBN or the, the Crouch uh, family now because Paul Crouch has passed away since. The, the, um, the Prince, Freddie, Freddie Prince, uh, not Prince, but Price, Fred Price and his family now and so forth. And some of these teachers that are out there teaching false doctrines and we know of them. We know of the Calvinists. We know of uh, these people. And not that Calvinists are teaching f false heresies, but they struggle with uh, once saved, always saved, which is another subject. So they have some credibility with the people, and the people know who they are, and they understand that. Notice in verse 2 that, that, that Hanana raises a question. Uh, was he sincere, or was he really self-deceived? Or was he deliberately pretending to be a prophet of God? Because he contradicts Jeremiah's warning here with authority. Jeremiah puts it on the yoke and says judgment is coming 
And you'll be in bondage. This is what the Lord says. And he comes and says, no, I've taken that yoke off. Judgment will be done with, with authority. Who do you believe? That's a hard one. That's why it's important to read your Bible and know what you believe. And then when someone behind a pulpit says something, you can say, that's not true. That's not true at all. Because I know it doesn't say that in the Bible. Now, if it is a doctrine, then, then I would run. <laughs> I would run. If it is an essential, I would run. If it is a foundation of Christianity, I would run. But if it's a, if it's a gray area, if it's a gray area, then, then I would say that's his opinion, and we can disagree agreeably. For instance, church, church government. How, does, how is a church supposed to be run? Well, Calvary Chapel takes the philosophy of the Moses style. The Moses was in communion with God. He was the mediator between God and the people, and so he was the leader. And we take that style, and we say the pastor is in communion with God, and he's the leader. God directs the pastor, the pastor leads. And then he raises up people like Moses raised up a bunch of people, men that were filled, filled, filled with the Spirit and could lead the people because it was too much for him. And so we've taken that mentality and, and brought in Timothy and Titus and so forth and to establish elders and pastors and things like that. But other churches do it differently. The pastor is hired and the church decides what he'll teach on. The church decides what his salary is. The church decides what he will do. The church will decide whether they want to keep him or not and they'll just throw him out if they don't like him after a while. That's a different uh, government of the church. Now, I like, my, I like the Calvary style more than that other style. For me, that's a harling. And you don't want a harling in a church because then you're not going to get the truth. He's going to please the people more than he's going to share the truth with you. And so just a different style, but you can learn to disagree agreeably. That's an area that, okay, it's not a big deal. I can live under this. I know people who are Catholic that don't believe in the sacraments, they believe that Jesus alone saved them, but they're there in the church hoping that they're able to reach other people with the truth. But they consider them Catholics, and I believe they're going to heaven. Now, there are Catholics who believe in the sacraments, and they add to the death of Christ by saying, not only do you believe in the death of Christ on the cross, but you also have to keep all these sacraments, the Holy Communion, uh, your confirmation, you know, and all of those sacraments. And if you don't keep those, then you're not entering into heaven. You may go to purgatory. Now, those people are lost because they believe in that lie. That's not scriptural. But in the gray areas, we have grace and love for one another. These two contradicted each other completely. Now, notice how he spoke boldly, using the same introductory formula as, as Jeremiah did. He, he firstly starts, thus speaks the Lord of hosts. No, Jeremiah said that. So he uses the same words. Thus says the Lord. Oh, okay, look, the Lord's speaking again. Uh, furthermore, he's called the prophet, verse 1, and so was Jeremiah. Same title. He's announcing, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon, verse 10. He uses the same prophetic perfects there in the Hebrew, and it's called the perfect of certainty. So like Jeremiah, this is going to happen, and it, it, it won't be lifted for 70 years. That's going to happen. So he uses the same thing, says, I've broken it. It's going to happen. The same thing. So how do you know who's telling the truth or not? It's a struggle. Hannah sets a definite date, two years, and uses specific names, Je Jehoiakim and Jehoiachin, verses uh, 3 and 4. He uses kings and references. So you're listening to this guy and going, wow, he's got the references. He's got the same the prophetic power and authority. He's a priest. Yeah, okay, this is wonderful. Two years and it'll be over. But wait a minute, didn't Jeremiah say 70 years? Oh, but we don't like that. Maybe he's wrong. Maybe the Lord changed his mind. And you can just imagine all these things going through your head. So who's telling the truth? That's the question. So who's telling the truth today? What pastor is sharing the truth? I think the pastor that's going through the word of God from Genesis to Revelation, teaching book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and expounding upon it, I think you can trust that person. But a person that comes up here and, and gives a topical message Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, uh, it's hard because he can pull scriptures out here and there to back up his topic, but are they in context? Are they applicable to his topic? You just don't know. You have to really study the topics and the messages, in, uh, the scripture messages in its context to really get the, the, the true meaning there. And that's a lot of work. 
And so a lot of people just accept it as truth. And so you have pastors getting up there and saying, God loves homosexuals, and he does. That's the truth. God loves the whole world. But God hates the sin. And they're saying, no, God loves the man, and he's able to see that pure love, pure love there, just as they love one another, as a, as a man and a woman loves one another, God will love them too. God will not judge them because it's pure love. And they use that topic. And they bring out all the scriptures on loving and mercy and grace and how God is so wonderful and beautiful and loving and caring and he overlooks sin and blah, blah, blah and all those areas. And you're like, oh, wow, this is like awesome. So God does love the homosexual. But then they leave out Romans chapter one, you know, where God's gonna judge them. He actually leaves them to their abased mind. So going through the word, going through the word, I think you're safe. Not only that, are you saved? I mean, that is a big one. Do you really have a relationship with the Lord? Are you born again? Because I believe, like the Bible says, my spirit will bear witness of your spirit. Because if we have the same spirit, it will bear witness. You know. You know when you come up to someone and there's, hey, I'm a Christian, and then you start listening to them, you're going, that's not the kind of Christian I know you should be. There's something not right. This is a different spirit. The same spirit will bear witness of that. And that's why we're all here. Uh, many of us have been here for years, tens of years, because we have the same spirit. Those that don't have the same spirit, they'll leave. They'll leave because they don't have the same spirit as you have. So it's important that we're born again. Now he boldly broke the yoke worn on Jeremiah. He announced that Babylon's domination was soon coming to end. He literally grabbed the yoke from Jeremiah and took it off him to just really display, you know, kind of like these, these preachers on TBN, you know, when they tr try to make a point and they get all dramatic, you know, and they bring up stuff, you know, and they're like, oh, and you're like, going, oh, man. And so then now you're really focused on this dramatic thing and then you're forgetting all the truth. So you have to be careful with that. And he literally takes it off Jeremiah, rips it off and says, boom, just like that, God is going to free us in two years. Yeah, I love that. That's wonderful. I can believe that. I like that message better than Jeremiah's message. So he spoke with boldness and accuracy, yet, yet he was lying or deceived. Verse 3, look at Within two full years, I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. And I will bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captivities of Judah, and or who went to Babylon, says the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So very clear, very bold. Here's Jeremiah's response in verse 5. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people who stood in the house of the Lord. Now they're having this debate. They're making judgment calls here. By the way, we are to judge. The Bible's clear that we can judge. That's, that's one thing that just gets into the church and you hear Christians say, oh, judge not, least you be judged. Don't judge me. I'm just saying, but don't judge me. You know, that's not true. First Corinthians chapter five, Paul made it very clear. We're not to judge the world, but we're to judge the church, inside the church. We're to look at the church, we're to look at one another and we're to encourage and, and, and strengthen one another to do the right thing. Not to judge the condemnation, but to say what you're saying or how you're living is wrong and you need to change that and we're here to help you to do that and doing as loving and as caring as possible. Why don't we judge the world? Because the world's already judged. John chapter three says it's already condemned. And so it's already condemned. It needs to be saved. So we evangelize the world. We share with them that you guys are condemned already. It, it, you know, you're in jail. It's like a prisoner. You're in jail already. No, I'm not. Yeah, look, there's bars in front of you. I'm on the outside. You're on the inside. You're in jail. So we need to get you out of jail. No, I'm fine here. I'm not in jail. <laughs> no, you are in jail. Uh, you can't tell him and say, hey, you're gonna go to jail. Well, wait a minute, I'm already in jail. So you can't condemn him already. No, but you can offer him freedom. We can get a parole, we can get you a better lawyer, and we'll get you out of there. Really? How you do that? Through Jesus Christ. He died for you. So we are to judge one another. And they're standing there, and they're having this debate. 
you know, and, and, and Hananiah is just kind of like, give me the yoke, Jeremiah. Like, hey, remember when we were kids wrestling around? You know, give me that yoke. And I threw it on the ground and made this display. And so Jeremiah's like responding now. He stood there in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, amen. I love that response. He just goes, amen. The Lord do so. The Lord perform your words, which you have prophesied, to bring back the vessels of the Lord's house. And all who carried away captive the Babylon from Babylon to this place. Jeremiah stood there and he just said, Amen. He understood that Hananiah was challenging his authority, his position as a prophet, and all he could say was, Amen. Or or I hope so. I hope so. I, I don't think he agreed with him. I think what he was probably saying was like chapter 11, he used kind of the same phrase, may the Lord do so. That would be nice if the Lord did that. That's one way of answering someone that's attacking you. You know, Well, maybe you're right, and I hope this country doesn't go down. I get that a lot from some of my liberal friends on Facebook. Uh, we'll mention some things. We had a, a, a big argument, and all these posts started going off because this guy's very liberal, and a lot of his friends are Christians too. And so he's saying, this country is going down because of the conservative Christian fa fanatics, blah, blah, blah. And so then the Christians get in there and start arguing back and forth and, and so forth. And so he'll make statements and, and so forth. And I'll just say, you know what? I hope you're right. I hope this president will do the right thing. Now, will he? Probably not. But, but if he does, that would be wonderful. But if he's wrong, I'll tell you what, if this country does go down, and it's done. Christianity was here before it, and Christianity will be here after it. That's the truth. And then I told him, we love you. Because his friends were saying, man, you're so fanatical, you liberal, blah, blah, blah. I said, hey, we love you, and we just want you to know the truth. So whether this country crumbles, you know, we'll still be around, and we'll still love you. Because God loves you. So it's a good answer. Amen. I hope so. Some scholars say that he was using sarcasm as a response here, that he wasn't uh, necessarily sincere. He didn't defend himself, nor challenge, or even say, you're a liar. <laughs> you're lying. Do you know you're lying? You know where liars go? They go to hell. You know, he didn't do any of that. You know, he just says, oh, I, I hope so. Because of his love for the people, because of his love for Hannah, Maybe he thought, you know, if, if that happened two years, that'd be great because then the people wouldn't suffer as much, you know, and so forth. But I think he knew that that wasn't going to happen. He just didn't want to start a big old argument. Nevertheless, hear now this word, verse 7, that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets, now he's going to explain, the prophets who have been before me and before you of old prophesied against many countries and great kingdoms of war and disaster and pestilence. As for the prophet who prophesied of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. Look, amen. Given enough time, two years, we'll know if you're right. And if you're not right, and we're still in bondage, you're a false prophet. Given enough time, and we'll know for sure what you're all about. That's what he was saying there. In the battle between Jeremiah and Hananiah, time would tell which prophet was right. And it's so true. It is so true. I don't know how many fads have come into Christianity. And I've seen come and go, come and go. Even these new fads of accepting homosexuality, eventually that's going to be gone. Eventually they're going to realize this is wrong. <laughs> We've been teaching the wrong thing and it's not working. They're coming in and they're changing us completely. Because what's happening? We're, right now, we're at the point where we're accepting the homosexual into the church. But what happens when all of a sudden now they're running the church? What's going to happen? It's really going to be a mess. Because now in their children's ministry, now in the men's ministry, they're, they're everywhere and they're sitting down and they're holding hands and they're kissing and all, it's going to change everything. And the church is all going to go, wait a minute, we did the wrong thing here. This is not what Christ wanted. Happened with Willow Creek. 
when they started doing doing the seeker friendly let, let's let's meet the people with items let's give them the best worship let's hire professionals to come out and really get them motivated and riled up you know with the music and you're just like wow this is wonderful and after 15 years they realize we've just created a bunch of carnal christians they really don't know the lord they realize that you know where the guy is today he's now one of oprah winfrey's advisors yeah ridiculous because ultimately in time that same blog that i was ta talking about is called successfulwallpaper.com he says, truth is something. When it hurts, those who hear it is something that's difficult to accept at times. It's strange in that it has the capability to hurt at first, yet over time it heals. Jesus used the expression, the truth shall set you free in John 8. Other phrases like the truth of the matter is, be honest with me, and the famous line shouted in the movies, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> instantly cures that whatever follows will not be easy to accept by the listener so why do we lie uh, and why are we lied to some feel that sometimes it's best that the best way to go to at the time it's the best way to go to at the time some would say it's just a little white lie i love what romaine used to always say a little lie is like a little pregnant it's still a lie right you're still pregnant it was like randy said hey i'm gonna be a little late i'm like little you're late <laughs> whether it's little or a lot you're late <laughs> not, not that i was getting on him he's he's more entitled to being late because he's always here so i'm not getting him in at all but as austin o'malley once said those who think it is permissible to tell white lies soon grow colorblind When you start telling one lie, you soon find yourself telling another lie to cover the first one up, then another, then another. And soon you realize that it would have been better to just tell the truth. I wouldn't even get into the topic of how those lies can eat away at your conscience. I feel that many of you already know that uncomfortable feeling. Telling the truth and being honest is always the best policy, always. Yes, some believe that ignorance is bliss. Actually, sometimes it very well is. I know that sometimes the truth hurts big time. I understand that, but sooner or later, the truth will come out. And when it does, those mistruths, those fibs, those distortions, those cover-ups will hurt multitudes more than if the truth would have been given from the start. He goes on and says, I also would like to add that the truth is not equal to keeping it real. You ever see that on Facebook? That people, I'm just keeping it real. What they're saying is I'm, I'm giving myself permission to just smack you in the face and I'm just keeping it real. The truth doesn't have to be rude or offensive. I'm talking about facts and honesty here. We are not perfect beings, but we do have brains which have the wisdom to determine the difference between knowing when to tell people the truth and when to be polite to people. Isn't that true? I think he's right on. He's right on being diplomatic, being gentle, being loving when you share the truth, even though saying the truth is hard. So notice what uh, Hananiah does. He gives a symbolic act here in verse 10. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke off of the prophet Jeremiah's neck and he broke it. And I spoke in the presence of all the people saying, Thus says the Lord, even so I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all the nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. So his hope was to nullify Jeremiah's symbolic act by contradicting it with another symbolic act, right? Well, here's Jeremiah walking around with the yoke. Okay, fine, and I'll take it, and I'll break it and say, ah, oh, see, God's doing a work, dramatic symbol there. And he, really, and he really gives us a specific time, two years. And we will know what God is going to do. Now, this would have encouraged them. Instead of settling down in Babylon, like God said, look, you're going into Babylon for 70 years, so just accept it. Do the best you can. Be a light. Be an example. And I'll get you out at the right timing. But this two years, 
this would incite them to fight back. Oh, we got two years. Let's fight. Let's get out of this situation. Let's do whatever. Let's get into the political arena. Let's like write petitions. Let's hire lawyers. Let's let's do whatever it takes. Let's rebel. Let's not do our work. You know, whatever it is, in order to get out of this situation that much sooner, if we can. So notice what Jeremiah does here in verse twelve. Now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the true word of the Lord, after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, "Go and tell Hananiah." saying, Thus says the Lord, you have broken the yoke of wood, but you have made in their place yokes of iron. Mm. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of all the nations that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. I have given him the beast of the field also. It says, All you've done is strengthen my hand on this judgment. So now I'll try to break an iron yoke. There's no way. I've just now forced it upon them because of what you have done. So there's no escape for them. They would serve Nebuchadnezzar. Then the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, but you make this people trust in a lie. That's heavy right there. That's heavy for a pastor, for a person that stands behind a pulpit, supposedly preaching the truth, and he's lying. He's lying. Remember years ago, I was with a friend, and uh, he told me about this guy who wrote a book on tithing. He goes, he, he said, this guy's pretty well off. He said he's a pastor of a church. And he wrote a book on tithing, and he teaches, he says, but he said, I only have one problem with him. Uh, he goes from one woman to the next woman to the next woman to the next woman. He sleeps with all these girls. I'm like, this is a pastor <laughs> behind a pulpit? He goes, yeah. Wow. Wow. I think of uh, Jimmy Swaggart. I remember that story years ago. You know, preaching from the pulpit and the lies. That's a heavy thing to think about as you preach the word of God. Are you sharing the truth or are you lying? I would be very fearful. Imagine the weight on their shoulders knowing that they're lying if they know the Lord. There's no weight if they don't know the Lord. To them, it's like, oh, well, I'm getting rich on this situation. Verse 16, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will cast you from the face of the earth. This year you shall die because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. Wow. <laughs> because you lied... God says judgment's coming on upon you, not in two years, but in one year. You'll be dead. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. So he had two, but he passed away in that one year, as Jeremiah had said. His sudden death for lying reminds us of several people. We know Ezekiel chapter 11. Pelethith's death was because of lying. We also know of Ananias and Sapphira, their death because of lying. Let's turn there, Acts chapter 5. Here's a couple that lied to the Lord, and it's very clear. This is New Testament, by the way. We're in Jeremiah, Old Testament. Now here we come to New Testament, and we have the same situation. We have the same situation where here's a couple who's, who's pretending to be very righteous and religious. They want people to know, I'm a good guy. I'm a good person good woman look what we do look what we've promised look at what we've delivered look at me this is religion in its purest so here's this couple in the church it says but a certain man verse one named ananias and sapphira his wife sold their possessions and he kept back part of the proceeds his wife also being aware of it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles feet but peter said ananias why has satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the peace of the land for yourself. You see, they had promised to sell their land and to give it to the Lord. But what they did was they sold their land for a lot and they figured, wow, this is a lot. Let me keep a little bit and then I'll give the Lord the rest of it. They'll never know. Only you and I will know, honey. And so let's do that. And so he went and brought the offering to Peter acting all pious. Look at us, Peter. Are we going to get a little plaque on the window? 
Uh, can we sit in a certain chair? Okay, can you applaud us? Can you say our name maybe before the congregation so that they know that, that we did this wonderful work? And Peter says, well, why has Satan filled you? <laughs> why has he filled you that you would lie? You would lie. And then he's, uh, he says in verse 4, while it remains, was it not in your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. See, you might get away with it to a man, but you can't to God because he sees it. And you're not sinning against man. You're sinning against God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. Wow. Wow. It has nothing to do with giving, by the way. It has nothing to do with giving has to do with the attitude that we give that we're giving to make people think that we're pious that we're okay man i am a wretched sinner i tithe but i am a wretched sinner i should be giving more than that because god gave more to me i've been tithing since i got saved because i read it in the scriptures and i again i don't understand you read it in the scriptures and then you go i don't want to do that it's pretty clear, and like I've done it from the very beginning. But I'm wretched. It doesn't make me pious or holy or separate than anyone else. God gave it all. Moses commanded a tenth. Before the law, it said a tenth was given to Melchizedek. And then the New Testament says, give with a joyful heart. And so you combine that together, you give with a joyful heart your tenth. And if the law says a tenth, if that's what God required of us, how much more does grace say? Because grace is grace. God has given us so much grace. But this has nothing to do with giving. It has to do with our attitude of giving. And then trying to pull it off upon people that you're pious, and that you're a righteous Christian. Be careful because you're lying to God, not to man. And he breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men rose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. I love that. It was like poop, poop, poop. <laughs> this is really that quick. Now, it was about three hours later when his wife came in. Three hours later, not knowing what, what had happened. And Peter answered her, answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. And Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Wow. Three hours later, the guys are just returning. And she's like, so did you sell the land? Oh, yeah, we did. Are you going to give us a plaque? Put my husband's name first and me right behind because I'm humble. And so I'll just put, uh, sit in the back, you know, we'll do that. You know. How could you lie to the Lord your God? And the, f the feet of the men who just buried your husband, they're at the door and now you're going to die too. It's not about the money. It's about the attitude. Uh, Paul was clear in chapter 9 that when we give, we give cheerfully. It's out of joy. It's because we know what the Lord has given me. The Lord didn't have to send his son. Could he have sent an angel? No, created being. Could he have devised another way? There was no other way. It had to be personal. It had to be the Lord himself. So he sends his son, Jesus. Jesus, here we are in heaven, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, from eternity. We've always been. We're spirit and complete. And now I'm going to take you, the Holy Spirit will take you, plant you into the womb of a virgin. You will no longer be with me in heaven. You will now become a man. You will now leave all this glory to become a man. You're going to leave everything you have here, greater than all, greater than everything you created, and you're going to become a man. That'd be like us saying, you're going to become a cockroach. We're going to send you to the cockroaches, and we're going to make you the super cockroach. And you're going to go and save all the other cockroaches. Wow. That's what he's done. We're a bunch of cockroaches. Now, that's truth. I know it might be hurting right now, someone. <laughs> and I don't mean to hurt you. But that's what God Almighty, who is pure and holy, 
is doing, you're going to become a man <laughs> with limitations. And you're going to live like that for eternity. He gave up a lot. He gave up a lot in heaven for us. And he came a man. And then he took our sins upon his body. It would be like you and I right now. He had the same body. He had the same body, the same feelings. You, you pinch me, it, he'll go ouch. You know, he, it'll hurt. You, you, you dig enough, the blood will come out. You know, there's muscles, there's tissues there. He'll feel it all. And that's why he was in the garden praying, sweats of blood, so much under stress. Take this cup away from me. Please, if there's another way. No, there's no other way. You've got to go, son. Is there someone else? Sorry, son, you've got to do it. But is there a religious act, uh, something they could do? No, son, you've got to do it. Okay, father, I'll do it. And so he did it. He went there and then my sins and your sins were all laid upon him. There he bled, bruised, uh, muscles were open. and He gave it all. He gave it all for us so that we wouldn't have to go through that. <clears throat> and so then we st now stand here in the world and we're like pious, so look at me. I'm righteous because of Jesus Christ and I'm better than other people and I don't have to forgive that person and I don't have to forgive this person and you know, I'm righteous and I'm right and they're wrong and we deserve death. We deserve death. Yeah. He did it all. And we complain 10% that's too much and I can't give it all and I can't give more and the pastor wants this and the pastor wants that. That's, you know, he gave it all. How about you just go to hell? <laughs> you know? That would be another alternative. No, Jesus still loves you. He still cares about you. He doesn't care about the money. He doesn't care about the status and all that stuff. He cares about you and your heart. And he loves you. And he paid for your sins right now. He paid for the future sins. And even the attitudes that we get and have from time to time. He paid for them all. And, and God sees you pure and holy. Isn't that amazing? Even though we're not. God still looks at you and here's my righteous daughter. You're like, who's he talking to? <laughs> here's my righteous son. Is he talking to me? Yeah, through the blood of Jesus Christ, I see you. You're pure. You're already complete. Ephesians says you're already sitting in the heavenlies. You're already there. He sees the end already as though it happened. That's what he told Moses when uh, he told me he wasn't going into the promised land because he had sinned. He misrepresented God. He made the people think God was angry and mad. God's not angry and mad at us. He loves us. He's saddened that we don't see that and understand that. And we have this pious attitude. But he told Moses, look out there in, into the promised land. I'm going to show you what's there. And he said, look out there. Now, you can't see it now, he's told them. But he says, I already see them as though they're already there. And so there's Dan. There's Nephtalon. There's, there's Benjamin and Joseph. And there's, you know, Reuben. And there's Levi. And they're already there. And God saw that. And God sees us already in the heavenlies because of what Jesus Christ has already done for us. God is awesome. And he is great. But if we lie and we become self-righteous and religious, you know, God will deal with us. He will deal with us. Let me close. As I said earlier, I believe all lies will one day be exposed by truth, even given enough time. The truth may hurt, but ultimately it heals. In the end, both the giver and the receiver of this truth will be grateful that truth was given instead of a lie. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, it, it, it's, it's so simple that even a child understands it. We're guilty of our sins. And when we stand before God, we will be guilty. But we don't have to be separated from God for eternity. God will allow us into heaven if we just believe in the work that His Son has done. If we accept His work, we accept what He has said in the Scriptures for our lives by asking Him to come into our hearts and be our Lord. And that we would give our lives to him to study his word and to change, allow the spirit to change us in time, not overnight, but in time, growing to know God personally and having that intimate relationship with him. That's what the Lord wants. 
And you can have that. And what's so amazing is you don't have to do anything but just pray and ask the Lord to come into your heart. I had to do it. And I remember getting on my knees in my company chart car and just saying, Lord, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and he took my sins away. Now give me eternal life and help me to live for you. That's all I did and boy, my life changed because it was sincere and it was from the heart and I knew where I was going, but God's grace was there for me and God can do the same for you.